right, hey, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm glad uh, we had an opportunity to uh, get this panel together and uh, share a range of experiences with psychedelics. Um, I think uh, they're not for everyone, but for those that can experience some benefit from it, um, we just wanted to explain um, our stories and how it helped us and how we've seen um, it help others. So, um, I'm going to focus on the, my part of speech on uh, MDMA. Um, you may also know it as Molly or Ecstasy. Um, though Ecstasy, I should know, is um, a pill form that is typically cut with um, kind of poor quality amphetamine, so I would kind of advise against that. Um, you, you really want the pure experience. Um, uh, so, uh, I've witnessed the, the, probably the most memorable um, transformations I've seen is um, I had a friend with uh, PTSD. Um, he had been out of the military for about two years and he was still having pretty bad um, flashbacks and just readjusting to society was a real difficulty for him. So um, we acquired some and um, I sat with him and he had a chance to open up like he, he couldn't before. Um, you know, I mean, he usually when I saw him, he tried to discuss it and um, he, he just couldn't. He'd freeze up and he would say, you know, never mind. Um, and I knew he wanted to get it out, but um, so I thought this would be a good way for him to <coughs> get those feelings out and um, just move past it. And um, so the next day he came to me and just like told me how much it changed him and um, he said just, you know, thank you for this. Um, and so I followed up with him again in two months um, and we did one more dose of them, and uh, it's it's happy to it's good to see a smile on his face now, which uh, was absent for quite some time. Um, and another friend um, was um, unfortunately a victim of rape, and um, she it was such a traumatic experience that she she couldn't even receive a handshake, so any physical touch was, was very, um, just very traumatic for her and she, um, as you can imagine, it's hard to live a life like that, so, um, uh, same thing, um, gave her a dose and then two months later um, followed that, and, and the reason I say we wait two months is um, that's a safe period of time to um, let, let your serotonin levels restore. Um, I really advise against taking, um, just for harm reduction purposes, um, really just taking consecutively and irresponsibly. Um, so we're, we're all about harm reduction here. We just want to um, also educate um, for those that may not have experience with it. So, um, And it, it was good to see her uh, a few months later, um, was in a relationship again and could function normally. And, um, it's just beautiful see. Um, so for myself, um, uh, I actually had really bad um, ecstasy uh, back, uh, this was 10 years ago probably, and um, uh, unfortunately, uh, as I said, wanting to avoid that, it's usually, if there's fake ecstasy, it's, um, or really bad to cut, and unfortunately I had a bad experience, so I, I stayed away from him. I was afraid there were, um, our friend Mark was about to join us. Yeah, sure not. <laughs> um, but, um, so I stayed away from him for a long time, and it was a lot of horror stories, but once I educated myself on the subject, I, I knew that it was something I wanted to try, and, um, um, so, Growing up, I, I lived in a really bad neighborhood, and um, really bad. Um, uh, there was a lot of like that. Someone got shot from my house, um, the whole nine yards. So, um, and welcome. Um, and my dad was, uh, I think, the. Plan
financial stress. Um, and we, we were very low income, I think. Um, that really got to him, and he was stressed out all the time. And um, as a result, he never really showed affection. He, he never said it loud, he never hugged us. Um, so that was some, something that kind of kept with me for a long time. And um, um, so um, I, I was scared to try my first time. I took a very low dose just by myself. I didn't know how I was going to react. You know, no one wants to freak out in front of anyone. So, um, um, but I had it and I, I had a really strong urge to be around other people. Um, so, again, waited two months um, and um, this time with a group of trusted friends and it, it was really a revelation for me. It, the change stuck with me forever and, um, you know, you guys know me here. I tell everyone I love I love you guys. So. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, every time I do, I, I feel that a little more. I feel like I can be more open um, each time. I feel more comfortable with my own body, and um, uh, especially after this car crash, you know, it was really traumatic, and. Um, I was in a pretty dark place, so um, I, I don't know what I would have done without it. I mean, my friends and family were very supportive, but you know, they can't control what goes on within my mind. But only I can. So, um, so thanks, Andy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so with that, I will uh, pass the message on to Macy. Okay. I'm Macy. I am a very, very big advocate for the use of psychedelics. I gave a speech in Acapulco about um, my tough experience with, with life and how um, by the time I was 19, I had learned um, manipulation and money, what I thought was the only means to success. Um, and I had my first mushroom trip, and it was like a mirror had turned, and I got to see what kind of energy I was putting out to the world, which wasn't good. Um, and then shortly after that, I was introduced to the idea that our government wasn't our friend. I watched the uh, documentary Zeitgeist, and it flipped my world upside down. And then my, a very close person of mine uh, was uh, growing mushrooms at the time. He was 14. Um, so he was very smart, and they were they were growing so much that he just gave me this huge bag, and I was scared to try it again. But I think that mushrooms and psychedelics are anarchists in themselves, and if you don't follow the principles of anarchy or voluntarism, they're going to show you like, hey, there's another way to live here. Acid, I say, is like your best friend who will tell you the truth even if you don't want to hear it. Either way, if you have a good experience or bad, you always get a lesson out of it. Um, I was in a very bad uh, relationship. Uh, and that made me extremely reclusive. So actually this year um, I've been experimenting more with MDMA uh, to, to open my, my heart more and connect with other people because the person I was with made me close down. And um, so now I'm reopening that and I'm doing it through MDMA therapy. And um, also the, the biggest psychedelic that had the most change, and I've, I've done pretty much every psychedelic except peyote. And I've tripped in the last six years about, uh, I've estimated about 250 times. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm mentally sane still, so that's good. Um, but I tried ayahuasca. I, got to, I was fortunate to uh, experience ayahuasca in February of this year at Acapulco. And uh, it was so life altering that I realized um, that this was my purpose. My true potential was to become a shaman and open a retreat in Mexico where um, as, as a shaman, you go through a readjustment period after ayahuasca. I was explaining to them, it's like um, if you are in a cave and the lights are all on and you can see for miles and miles these crystal formations and then somebody shuts off the light and hands you a flashlight. Um, that's about two weeks after your ayahuasca experience. And you know what's there, you just can't find where it is at that point. So I went through a really, really hard readjustment period, and I couldn't get a hold of my shaman because you know I just didn't have that contact information. 
So I'm, I'm making a business plan to become a shaman myself. And the one thing that I really want to incorporate in my retreat is to um, call and, and, and keep in contact with the people, especially people in the Western culture, um, who, who decide to take this medicine. And it is medicine. It, it completely opens your mind to a new, a, a new way of thinking, um, that the universe is really all over. It's very forgiving. And the lessons that I got from ayahuasca are just my, it felt like I got 10 years of tantric yoga teachings in one night. So it, it was a pretty, pretty intense experience. So I, I want to give that medicine to other people. I want to do it as inexpensive as possible because I do think it's medicine. Um, and because it's becoming a more popular thing for people to go try as a therapy, um, you know, uh, people in South America are taking advantage of it and they're, they're charging like $1,500 for a week. I would like to do it much cheaper so people can still get this medicine and then have the connections with the people who come through my retreat. So psychedelics have completely changed my life. They've, they've put me on, they've changed my entire trajectory of where I would probably be without them. And um, I'm just grateful that I've had the opportunity and I live in this day and age of the psychedelic, psychedelic revival. So that's my story. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Wood and I love psychedelics. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I want to tell uh, about an experience I had with something called uh, DMT. Dimethyltryptamine. Uh, about the first time I ever tried DMT. I was in a pretty bad place myself. I had just uh, moved back from the West Coast where I had lived for uh, a few months with a long-term girlfriend of mine. And uh, I was really depressed that things had, our relationship had fallen apart, you know? And uh, that I had spent all the money to move out there and then move back and I had quit my job. I felt like my life was ruined. I was really depressed. So I tried DMT for the first time. I got it from uh, this younger brother of mine, who remained, remained nameless. But uh, yeah, after I tried it, it was amazing because DMT transports you to uh, alternate dimension. It really, it really does. It's uh, it's a totally life-altering, earth-shattering experience, and it gave me a level of perspective on the problems that I had in my own life. This is something that happens to people with natural. We get so caught up in the minor details of our own personal lives that we think that's all there is going on. And DMT allowed me, I say, it, it allowed me to zoom out. It allowed me to see the wider world. It allowed me to see that that job at Walmart really wasn't that great and that the couple grand that I spent to move out to Washington and back was pretty replaceable, as was the girlfriend who really wasn't all that special in the end. So. Yeah, like I said, it, it brought me out of a depression, it gave, it gave me a, a new lease on life, it gave me a perspective that the, the world is a lot bigger place than just my, uh, you know, relatively minor personal problems. So, I think there's a lot of wisdom that can be gained through the use of psychedelics that you can't gain from anywhere else. So that's, that's my experience. Because I have a question directly related to DMT, can you, can I ask that now or do yeah, I have to wait? Do it, jump in anytime. Okay, so I'm just curious. Um, if you feel like for, for that specific psychedelic, do you think that it's smart to be in a specific place? Do you think you need to do like some personal growth before it is to, to offset a bad trip? Can you speak to that at all? Do you have any experience Set with that? Set and setting is vitally important to the use of psychedelics. No matter what you're talking about, you definitely want to be as comfortable as possible. You want to be around people who you trust you want to be in a place where you're comfortable and you're familiar with, because it can, it's, it's a very strange experience when you do psychedelics, and it can get real scary real fast. So I would highly recommend doing it in the place that you're most comfortable around the people you're most comfortable with. I have to add on to that. I, I call it nesting, so you, you get everything that you need ready. A lot of the times, if you take acid or mushrooms, your place is going to become a tornado. You just can't do anything like you normally do in, in real life. You, you're in a different state of consciousness. So always nest, always prepare, get your water ready, and always drink a lot of water during it. A lot of people forget to drink water, so that's really important. Hi, my name's Mark. Um, I, I'm also here to kind of talk about some of my experience with DMT. Um, I also had kind of a similar experience with, with awakening, as some people say, by uh, 
watching the Zeitgeist movie and uh, really just kind of hit home exactly how fucked up things are and could get. And um, at that point in my life, I was just not in a great space. I was living with my mom in her basement. I was working at a shitty, really shitty job. Um, and, and things just weren't really going anywhere. And then I kind of had this bomb dropped on me and basically figured out that the world was kind of a huge pile of shit. <laughs> and uh, I, started, I started looking into DMT because I had tried acid and mushrooms before when I was younger. Excuse me. And um, I, I, I lucked into the Joe Rogan podcast about it on YouTube. And uh, I started getting really interested and in reading up a lot about it on uh, various websites and decided to, to try to make some of my own so that I could try it because I didn't see like there would have be really be any way to, to try it and I mean, you can't really find it. <laughs> yeah, but it's really easy to make. Dark net <laughs> markets have it, but the stuff is... Well, yeah, this was, this was before the dark net was even like, really going on. So, I think there's something to be said for making it yourself. Um, I think that had a lot to do with my experience being so amazing the first couple times. Do um, you have anything to add about that? It's kind of like cooking. If you put a lot of love into it, you're going to yeah. get a lot of love back. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it just kind of helped me turn my uh, attitude about the world around after kind of seeing what it is and then what it could be. And uh, just got me inspired to start trying to, to help make things better. And uh, I think it's had a, a really powerful influence on my life and my attitude about everything. And uh, I think it, it has the potential to help a lot of other people too. Yeah, I want to add to that too. I, I, I think that the making it yourself speaks to like Danny's question about it, about trust and about having the right setting. When you made it yourself, you definitely uh, you know what went into it. You don't got to worry about you know what was, is this is a shady product, you know. Right, right. So yeah, I definitely think that uh, that's part of the set and setting aspect of it. Is there a recipe book somewhere? Yeah. Uh, the the tech that's what they call these things is uh, that I used uh, or that. Uh, the person who is not me, who made it uh, uh, you, was uh, called DMT for the masses, and it's a, it's just Google that, and it'll give you a, a really good uh, little workup on how you can make your own at home. Yeah. Um, also, I, I just wanted to add for um, the purpose of harm reduction, um, uh, for, for those uh, doing MDMA, uh, it's it's very important to. Um, there's a, a common supplement, uh, l 5 hydroxytryptophan um, but you, you can find the vitamin oil, uh, L5-HTP, or just 5-HTP. Um, uh, the day, the night following, uh, three to five days, um, you, you'll want to take that. So you, you do take a, a, a large uh, dump here serotonin, so um, there can be uh, some depression if you don't do that. But, but not for everyone, but um, again, just want to um, really emphasize being safe and responsible in your views. So. Any questions at all? It's kind of a strange question. Uh, can I go up to the mic or you guys? Oh, oh, sure. I don't know. Yeah. No. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. I'll just say it. That'll be the session after he asks. <laughs> so you were talking about. Uh, Making it yourself, and um, you know, I, I listened to uh, Joe Rogan podcast, and oh, had, Joe Rogan. yeah, yeah, and uh, he had been speaking about uh, uh, great intelligence that people are starting to recognize, and so my biggest question is: is is there a difference in using DMT that? would be produced from plants that would be close to your environment that you have been living in personally because 
if there is some kind of plant intelligence, would not your interaction have been with that over the course of time? Would it be more beneficial to use that than to get, say, something that was from halfway across the world? I, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, I most of the DMT I've smoked has been derived from Mimosa hostilis, which is uh, grown in the Amazonian jungle as well as uh, as far north as southern Mexico. But DMT is just one of a whole class of psychedelic tryptamines that are naturally occurring in plants. And different, lots of different species of plants contain DMT in different amounts, as well as different tryptamine profiles of different chemicals that are similar to DMT, like like uh, the Illinois bundle flower also has DMT, but it's got more of the NMT and less of the NNDMT that you that you expect out of your mimosa hostilis. So it definitely would be a different trip. You'd have a different experience. I don't know how much of a different make difference it would make whether you grew the plants or not, but once again, it would give you the idea of trust, that level of comfort, knowing the source of the stuff you're ingesting. No, you, you did it. <laughs> well, that says plant specific, Philanthropus grass, am I saying that right? Polaris. Yes. Polaris. 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 Sorry. Uh, so, is that a less of an experience or just a different experience than. It's kind of different. It's, it's not. It has a different tryptamine profile. I've never done uh, Polaris DMT myself, so I can't really speak to that. But I would assume it would be slightly different. Okay. The mimosa root has um, contains the most DMT. Yeah. Um, that's why it's it's the most used. Um, but yeah, you were talking about the Illinois bundle root. Apparently, that only has about fifty percent uh, the amount of uh, DMT as the mimosa. Um, so you could just ex extract it again. Um, that's what I I learned that you can just re extract it. Um, I just wanted to add also, uh, uh, talking about uh, making sure you know you have what you think you have and the correct ingredients. Um, I just well, generally speaking, also for any drugs, um, I would really recommend people test their drugs. Um, there's a, a general kit, a marquee reagent test kit, a very cheap. Um, you can get online for about twenty five bucks. Um, it's like fifty cents to test. Um, it's very simple. It comes with a little color chart. Put a small amount of, you know, whatever you're having uh, in just a little um, test tube and drop some solution in. And, um, it will turn a certain color. You're part of the color chart. Um, and just so you know, um, you're getting what you actually think you're getting. That, that's very important because, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people um, pushing research chemicals that are not really studied in the human body. Um, uh, also, uh, you may see small flashes of other colors, which will indicate a, a cut um, in that product. So um, I, whatever your drug of choice, I would always recommend um, just making sure you're getting what the person you have uh, says you're getting, or hypothetically, repeat yourself, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> We've been talking some about about uh, extracting your own DMT and, and try trying to DIY some of these things, but it's it's important to remember that if you're going to do that, to use um, the purest ingredients that you can get. Like um, some of the instructions online will say to that oh you can use Zippo fluid or you can use like drain cleaning lye, and it's just not you can't. Do you gotta use food grade or lab grade chemicals, and uh, you gotta you gotta be careful about about safety with those things as well. Um, I know one one of the ingredients that people use is lye, and that can be very uh, dangerous to handle. So it, it's important to know these things before you get into it. So I I almost think that. It can go either way. You make it yourself and then you feel more comfortable because you know where all the ingredients came from. But also your first time, you could be a little nervous. I fucked it up. What, you know, if you have a trusted source who is willing to make it for you, maybe for your first time, 
maybe seeing and being part of that process might be good. Yeah. And then, you know, going into it, you might feel more comfortable about it. Definitely. Yeah, that's what I did when, when I learned uh, the process. So somebody was there and showed me, and yeah, it, was a, it was a pretty cool experience. <laughs> He had a, he had the food grade and lab yeah. lab uh, equipment, so that that was good. All organic. Yeah, I <laughs> I, uh, I had a degree in science. I did a lot of lab work in college and everything. So uh, so yeah, I I had a lot of confidence in my own abilities when I when I first made it. So but uh, I I realize that's not true for everybody. When when uh, the guy I got it from had a degree in science. <laughs> <laughs> How long is the process of like production? Uh, the longest part is freeze precipitation, which takes a couple days. So yeah, within 48 hours from uh, from raw material to finished product. Um, just stepping away from the process and back to you know uh, experience, a lot of first time people are afraid of having like a bad trip. What what advice do you have for people who have that kind of temptation? Set and setting. <laughs> Set and setting. Um, I actually, I talked about this because a lot of times um, uh, people in the 60s, you know, tried acid, they had a really bad experience. Then again, in that era, it was a little bit more violent, you know, they were fighting for a cause, but, you know, it was still a little bit violent. So, um, you know, that, that comes out, that it's your mind and whatever is happening in your mind um, will come out. But I always tell people, you know, um, it's always good to try them again because if they, you know, if they were a liberal in the, in the 60s and then moved to, you know, voluntarists, they have a new perception and more than likely um, whatever psychedelic they take is going to flow. I think knowing the truth of the nature of our government already gives you a step above having a, a bad experience. I've only had two bad experiences on, on acid and uh, it was showing me that the person that I was with at that time was not... I was not supposed to be with him, and uh, it, it turned into a, a pretty uh, scary experience. But you just have to remember that the the psychedelics are trying to show you something. It is your mind, literally. We are an eternal library. Um, our minds are completely eternal, and, and when you take psychedelics, you have that key to access that knowledge. So even if it's you know, it's just trying to steer you in a different direction. If you're if you're in a, a situation that you're not supposed to be in, it's going to show you. Um, but for the most part, I think. Voluntarists have good experiences on it. Um, one thing, a uh, little piece of advice I try to give people about um, having bad trips is that it's it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, it's it's I I I, I kind of compare it to like being in a scary movie. It's just a it's a frightening experience, but you're not going to get hurt. You really have nothing to worry about. Um, you always have to remember that it's it's temporary and everything's fine. Calm seas never made a good sailor. Right. I just uh, yeah. I highly recommend that people that are you know insecure, real insecure, depressed, not to take any hallucinogenics. And, and if you're a little bit unsure, to take it with a trusted friend that can kind of like uh, talk you down. Guy, I've had to talk yeah, people it's, down. It's nice to have someone there to talk to you. One experience I've had with people. Tripping is, uh, especially if they're new to it, it's an altered state of consciousness that they're not used to. So a question I've heard a lot from, from new uh, psychedelic users is, am I going to be like this forever? <laughs> <laughs> and that is always the most important. The answer is always no. I've never seen anyone that ended up like that forever. So uh, it's nice to just nip those sort of thought, trains of thought in the bud and just say, no, no, it's, enjoy it while it lasts because it's definitely not going to last forever. It's good to be educated about it. If you're going to do yeah. something wrong. It's good to, it yeah. And if you're and if you're not educated about it, you, it's good to try it when there is someone very well versed in it around. Justin, I'm uh, just going to speak to bad trips. Uh, I've done uh, mushrooms more times than I can count, and uh, I used to have a horrible ulcer. And for whatever reason, that ulcer would make it a 50-50 shot if I was going to have a good trip or a bad trip. <laughs> So, the bad trips, I'm still here today. <laughs> yeah. But once again, that goes to the point, set and setting. If you're in miserable pain, you probably don't want to go on a psychedelic trip because it's yeah. going to but exacerbate you. You still gain something from the negative trip even. For instance, 
Yeah, I called. I had a really good bad trip a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I called a few people to come pick me up. I said, hey, you need to get me out of here. I, I, I don't want to be in this place. And I'm thinking they're on the same page as me. No, they're on the page of, you're tripping your balls off, and I don't want you over at my house. <laughs> so when reality hits in a situation like that, you learn something. Even though it was a bad trip, still gained something from like it. Like it's nice to have someone there you can trust, someone you can rely on and really count on because you know it's it's it can be that much more horrifying not to have anyone to rely on when you're in a, a incapacitated state. Yeah. So yeah, well, having well, you know, I mean, it sounds like you weren't in a good place oh, well. and in pain. That's that's yeah. probably not a good combination. I mean, you can have a good trip, but I, yeah, just. In that situation, I, I mean, you can wait. You know, I mean, there's other things you can do. Uh, but uh, yeah, I advise having what what we call a trip sitter, someone who preferably isn't on drugs themselves, but is will is willing to be there for you. Knows what you're getting into. Knows how long it's going to be, and is willing to be there to walk you through the process, hold your hand, and make sure that everything's all right with you physically. You know, you're not choking on your own vomit or something. You can call that guy Gandalf. <laughs> That's what we call him. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of what, can you talk more about the lengths of the experience? I well, that varies greatly. Uh, mushrooms, <laughs> probably about six hours. It all depends on how much you take, too. But uh, mushrooms, about six hours. Uh, acid, I've heard, eight to ten. Uh, DMT is known as the businessman's trip because it's uh, something you could do in a half hour lunch break. It really only lasts about 20 to 30 minutes and then you're back to normal. But it's incredibly intense while you're, while you're in it. So. I actually knew a guy who did that, who would, who would go on his lunch break and take DMT. That is hardcore. Yeah. I admire that guy. <laughs> um, if you take mushrooms with, like I like to um, put them in tea because it, the experience is, is a little bit more intense, but it only lasts about three, three hours. And I always start off, um, even now, and I'm pretty experienced with, with all types of psychedelics, but I still start out with only a half eight, um, just to get the feel, just to know where I am, get my groundings, and then I'll take more. Um, but I always recommend that for first timers. Start with a low dose, see how you feel, and then take more. Yeah, because there's also a lot of variety. I mean, one eighth of mushrooms might be a lot stronger than another eighth of mushrooms. Same thing with one tab of acid might be a lot stronger than another tab of acid. So start slow. Get to know the product before you, you go whole hog. Yeah. But definitely I'm, go whole hog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I was going to say, especially uh, with mushrooms, because they really need to be stored properly. Um, you, you can really test if they have been by just taking one and uh, just just bending it, and if it's you can bend it without breaking it. There's moisture in it because that's been sitting. The inside is going to be moldy, and um, you're probably going to get sick. And getting sick is not fun. So um, make sure whoever the trusted source you're getting from that they're um, they're they're really preserving them and doing it proper way. And if they're not, let them know. Um, you can get um, desiccant packets. They're you know a little pack inside like beef jerky and crap. Um, just throw a couple of those in there and store them in a Tupperware dish or something. Um, so I, no, I'm, I'm just guessing, you know, people on the internet told me I've never done it, but... <laughs> um, but yeah, just just take care that you, uh, you're you getting quality product that's not... And, and also, uh, like Macy said, the tea, uh, you're much less likely to get sick with the tea as well. Is there a Can any of you speak to the use of uh, salvia? I've never tried salvia. I was scared on salvia. I didn't like that very much at all. But apparently, there's people who I know somebody who loves it. So I guess it just depends on the person. Okay. I uh, actually have experience with salvia. Do you like it? Um, it's very intense. Uh, very introspective of a high, in my opinion, because uh, I did a little bit of research into it. Like the salvinorum A is the chemical, but you're not actually getting the high off of that. It relaxes a membrane around your cerebral cortex, and when that happens, an enzyme is actually released into your brain, so it's actually helping you get high off yourself. It is very intense, but very short-lived. Um, the best way to actually though, to get a trip off of it is if you can find a way to get pure suffering. You will feel pain. 
It, yeah, the coach tried to eat me. I remember that. that was I, I, I was a snake and I was on fire. <laughs> I, I had the same exact experience where I sank into the couch, the couch ate me. Yeah. And it was... A teambag chair. I, I feel like Sakya uh, uh, is a lot more of a dissociative, more so than a psychedelic. It feels a lot more like uh, like cough medicine or like ketamine or something like that. The reason for asking is just uh, curiosity if that's um, any relation to the lapse of time or recognition of time uh, that could be related to DMT. Because I, I felt a complete difference in time with Salvia, which that, um, that actually what had passed. Yeah, that, that can happen with DMT also, as well as a, a few other. Okay. But it's, it's not as drastic. I've heard people on salvia trips saying it felt like a month. With DMT, it's more like it's a half hour and it felt like an hour. It's not like a drastic multiple of your subjective time experience. It's, uh, it's manageable. Whereas I've heard salvia can be horrifyingly time dilated. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think you should plan on, I, it's not like, less likely, but um, even mushrooms, I've had trips where I've felt like I've lived a lifetime fast forward. Um, so, uh, I mean, if it does happen, just don't be surprised. Um, your sense of time will be distorted on, on any psilocybin mushrooms. Um, maybe not as drastically as the uh, salvia. I can have that. Okay. The, the important thing to keep in mind in any of those situations is, is to remember that when you come back, it will only have been, you know, an hour or 10 minutes or whatever, depending on what you took. So you don't really have anything to worry about. Even if it feels like it's been a thousand years, like you can be confident that it hasn't. <laughs> you have, uh, one, but is airwood.org still a, like a trusted source yeah, of information? Yeah. Yeah. Airwood, I, I would never take a drug, even over the counter, you know, stuff like Tylenol, unless I studied it first and, okay, and looked up how much sure. you need, how much is dangerous, what level. Is a is a threshold experience? What level is a is a hard experience? What the LD fifty is? Educate yourself about anything you ingest, not just drugs, food, everything you ingest. You should be studying before before you put it into your body. In my opinion, could you say that website name? Because I don't think arrowid.org. That's E R O W I D. It's uh, it's a great resource. They have everything from texts and uh, uh, ways to make drugs to Dot diaries of people's experiences and everything. It's a great way to build up that confidence you have before you try something, before you try a new experience. You can benefit from other people's previous experience. Yeah, I, I would say with the Arrowhead, um, it, it is a good reliable source. Though um, some of their mission, some of their information is a little outdated. Um, you can send each page; it will tell the last time it's been updated. Um, so, so check that. Um, there are more specific sites, um, like for mushrooms, uh, shroomery.org, uh, which is a, a great resource. Um, lots of veterans there have been growing for decades. Um, definitely suggest that for uh, mushrooms. So, Yeah, there's, there's a lot of forums out there, like Shroomery and uh, DMT Nexus. And, uh, there's, there's a ton of them. They've just got so much information, it's absurd. So, information on sources for base chemicals you can get, text how to make it, what your experience is going to be like, I mean, everything from the beginning to end. This is really good to memorize like the basics, like it's only going to be 20 minutes or something. I've had bad experiences like uh, DMT and yeah, it was really scary and knowing that it was going to be real short kind of like got me over the fear. If I thought it was going to be 20 hours or something, I'd have been real scared. And been just, just remember you're not always going to be like that. <laughs> yeah, well, with, with DMT, just just be aware that it, it really happens almost instantaneously. You, you really have to prepare yourself for that. Like, I can't think any other psychic up for just like two seconds. Just, you're there. So. Yeah, the peak that's is within you know, like a minute or two. That's why you need to know about these things so you don't get don't get scared. It, exactly. Educate yourself in every way you can. Yeah, the the fear is what will get you give you a bad trip. If you take DMT and what we call it is like a, is it a blast off? Is that yeah? You blast off of it. Yeah. Um, it does feel like somebody is almost taking you by the shoulders and pushing you back and and taking you within. So you know that's a normal feeling. So don't get you know freaked out if 
if you decide that it's something that you want to try, um, that's how it starts. And then, and then it's it's mostly smiles from there. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, usually. <laughs> Any other questions? Dave, do you have a question? What do you smoke your DMT with? Uh, in, in my experience, I've had a lot of times where I, I'll layer it with, uh, with marijuana, uh, put, make, like, put some marijuana in the bottom so it has something to soak into so when it uh, liquefies, it doesn't go just straight down into the bowl. And then also some marijuana on top so that you don't burn your, uh, you don't vaporize your uh, DMT right off of that. I've had pretty good luck with that. Uh, the best thing I've ever done is uh, vaporizing it, though. Straight vape from an uh, e-nail was uh, crazy. I've also, uh, there is a form of DMT you can make by mixing it with an acid to neutralize it, and that uh, forms something called DMT fumarate, which uh, you can insufflate or snort uh, or inject. It's intravenously active, and that was, when I did try intravenous DMT fumarate, that was an incredibly intense experience. Like I said, I, I'm not normally the type of guy who does needle drugs, uh, but, but there's a level of confidence when uh, you are the one personally responsible, which I wasn't, it was someone else, when you are personally responsible for uh, the, the whole process from beginning to end. Yeah, well, uh, some of the first DMT experiments were, they, they were all injections in a, a medical setting, so, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's not like taboo or anything else. That's actually how it, kind of how it began, so. How often do people like you have spoken to um, using MDMA safe period every two months? The DMT experience sounds like way more heightened, focused. How often do people want to try that? Or yeah. if once in a lifetime? The thing with DMT now? is that uh, it really breaks down and is washed out of your body very quickly. That's why the trip lasts so shortly. So it's not that you're doing physical damage, it's that it's so psychologically shaking that uh, you usually don't really want to do another DMT trip right afterwards because it takes a while just to mentally digest all the revelatory uh, experience you just went through. Ayahuasca is a little bit different than DMT. It lasts for, well, um, I took my first, I took three and a half cups of ayahuasca. And it's, D, it's the mimosa root uh, mixed with NAOI inhibitors. So when you're, you ingest it, it lasts for a long, long time. So I took my first cup at midnight, and I didn't stop seeing faces until 3 p.m. the next day. When I see, I said, I see, like, uh, ayahuasca is, to me, much different than uh, DMT. In fact, I prefer, I definitely prefer ayahuasca over DMT. Um, the the hallucinogen, I don't think they're hallucinations. Uh, halluc How do I say that word? Hallucination, right? That's it, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would look at the ocean and see like closed eyes with a smile or a side profile of a woman with a smile, but everybody was smiling. And, and the faces that I was seeing were, were so detailed. Uh, I, don't, I, I get detailed shapes on DMT, but I've never seen anything like what I've seen on, on ayahuasca. But I think that might be the MUI inhibitor with the DMT. Yeah, and uh, I would say with any psychedelic, uh, you, you really should take some time to reflect on, on what you saw and what you learned. Um, talk about it with your friends um, and, and just really digest it because then learn and better yourself. It's not just like, oh no, I saw some crazy shit and some shapes and I felt weird. Like that, That's not what it's about. Um, it, it's about changing your perspective and make, becoming a better person. So. Kate? Do you recommend um, psychedelics as a part of like therapy for people, like in conjunction with professional talk therapy? Yeah, there have been double-blind uh, studies done recently that have shown that it can be incredibly therapeutic for lots of uh, recovering from traumatic experiences and all sorts of other psychological issues. Like I said, I inadvertently cured a pretty severe depression the first time I did DMT. So it, I, I definitely think there's not only anecdotal but actual clinical evidence demonstrating that psychedelics can have an extremely positive effect on uh, mental disorders and uh, conditions. Um, do you guys know who Barry Cooper is? He of uh, Never Get Busted? He just opened an Ibogaine ayahuasca retreat in Mexico, 
And ibogaine is the African root. Um, ayahuasca is known as the grandmother of psychedelics. Ibogaine is the grandfather of psychedelics. It's uh, ayahuasca is definitely female. I can say that for a fact. I have not tried ibogaine, but um, he did a video of this woman who um, was extremely addicted to meth, and she came in. They filmed her right before she did her eight-day ibogaine experience, and um, she, you know, you you can tell she's she's done meth a lot of it. And he films her eight days later after her ibogaine experience. She looks like a completely different person, and even explained like this is very strange for me to not have an urge to do meth. So it, you know, it helps uh, reconnect yourself to you know your your inner self and and to get off addictions. It's uh, acid is um, helping with alcoholism and depression. Um, and MDMA is uh, for if you take two hits of MDMA, like you were ex expressing. Um, two hits of MDMA with a trained psychologist, uh, you can re reduce your post-traumatic stress symptoms uh, by 90%. So that's permanently. And that's why it's probably illegal because, you know, that compared to a lifetime of Prozac, <laughs> what are they making more money on? Um, but that's initially, it was initially made for um, couples therapy too because it gets you to open up and, and speak. So, um, you know, these, these drugs have, have the potential to heal. And I think you know that's that's why they're kept off the market in the first place. And um, I, I, I think that we're going through the psychedelic psychedelic revival right now. And I think people are more open to experimenting with their consciousness right now, which is good because it, it helps you heal. Yeah, um, I'd also like to add that uh, if anyone's familiar with the MAPS, uh, multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies, um, they're in uh, their stage three trials of uh, MDMA. Uh, primarily for PTSD, and uh, so we're we're making really good progress on that. Um, and uh, I, I think next year they're uh, going to have some pretty good results. We're finally going to publish the complete study, um, and so I think it's going to make a difference. We've got some uh, good things to look forward to in the psychedelic revival. So. Question. Well, if you're in a place of already. Um, where you feel comfortable with who you are, with yourself, with your happiness, what have you. What kind of reaction could you expect from this? Well, like I said, set and setting is really important, and that sounds actually optimal. You're going to have a really great time. I mean, you, you, I'm, optimally, you do want to be in a good headspace when you do psychedelics. Like I said, it can help you get out of a bad headspace, but it's, it's going to be more fun and maybe less therapeutic if you don't need the therapeutic. The first time that I took mushrooms, I did um, I did it in a really, really uh, unfamiliar place. I was in Seattle, Washington, and we were walking downtown, and I took uh, quite a few on an empty stomach with Dr. Pepper, which was not a good thing. And I ended up um, having a really bad time, but as I've evolved through my own, um, I, I did a microdosing for three months every day. I did microdosing on mushrooms, and it really taught me at that point, because I didn't love myself at that point, and it really taught me... How, how, how good of company I am for, for me, you know. Um, and so last year, though, I took mushrooms um, when I was walking in Central Park in Times Square. And I think that just, you know, once you, once you get comfortable with being in that state of mind, your set and setting can change. You can go out into the public, you know, just keep a pair of sunglasses on you. How, how much <laughs> mushrooms were you taking to microdose? I, uh, to microdose, I would take a half eighth or an eighth every day. Because I, I had a supplier at that point who was drilling a lot, um, but you eventually stop hallucinating uh, when you take that. But you do have like this all-around um, awareness, so it, it's really good to get through, you know, your day. I, I, I definitely recommend microdosing with mushrooms. Now, could you go into the microdosing a little bit more? Yeah, what is microdosing? Microdosing is um, so not giving yourself enough to you know have like that full on hallucinogenic um, experience. So um, it, your tolerance for mushrooms goes uh, up pretty fast after you've taken them like twice in a row. Uh, you know, uh, in two days, you stop hallucinating, but you do feel this all around awareness, and it it helped me get through my own therapy. Of, of figuring out who I who I was, I would even go out. I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood at that time, and cops were always around. And I would force myself to go out and sit and um, watch the cops drive around me to show that they don't have authority over me. So I did like little things like that. But it is just an overwhelming, like uh, or not overwhelming. It's just an overall 
awareness or high, um, you know, people didn't even know that I was on them. But you're happier. Yeah, you know, mushrooms seriously make you happier. And then, uh, you know, you don't have any addiction problem with it. I was able to get off of them right away uh, when I wanted. I was like, okay, I think this therapy session is done. <laughs> and um, yeah, then you don't have any problems getting off of them. They're not addictive at all, which is funny because they're, a, I'm pretty sure they're a schedule one addictive uh, drug, they say, but it, it's not at all. Okay, apparently we can't trust the government. <laughs> I know, man. That's, <laughs> that's the schedule you pull out. Yeah, exactly. You go, to, you go to schedule one, and then you look all those things up on Arrowhead, and then you do. <laughs> You're not wrangling. No. It's... <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, on the subject of microdosing, um, I've been following on Reddit. Uh, they have a really good sub. It's just r slash microdosing, and. Uh, that's primarily uh, microdosing on LSD. Um, typically, uh, they microdose between uh, 10 and 20 micrograms. Um, and uh, there just recently been some, uh, there are very few long-term studies published, but uh, they recently just had some that were uh, close to a year. Um, and uh, it seems to treat primarily depression, uh, but there, there's also some other benefits people are seeing from it. Um, general energy, uh, for people who have uh, like anemia and things like that, um, uh, but it, it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, so check out subreddit, uh, just microdosing on Reddit if uh, you're interested in that. They have hundreds of people sharing their stories, and uh, it's just self-publishing. Um, and someone's collecting a database right now, so those should be uh, published soon. Not sure where, but check it out. Any other questions? Well, about the microdosing on the acid, um, I mean, I don't want to ask if you ever tried it, but I guess... Kind of, has anyone you know? Has anyone you, has anyone you know ever tried doing the microdosing on acid? And if so, I mean, what would be the difference between microdosing on acid and micro, you know, is, would it, is it the same, like, therapeutic, would it, the same therapeutic effects as, like, microdosing on shrooms? Or... Is there something else you're getting out of that? Uh, I, I really can't speak to that. I did a small microdosing trial, um, but I, uh, I haven't really heard many people do it. Uh, Macy, you're actually the person who's told me about your effects on that. Um, so it would be interesting to um, see. Uh, maybe you could even post your results on there and help people compare. So uh, that would be interesting to, to see. And, but uh, it's, just, it's a little newer, uh, there's not that much data on it, but uh, it's really gaining momentum, so uh, I think we'll, we'll see some of that data soon. If, I, would, when someone you know is microdosing on shrooms, are you taking it like all at once, or are you like breaking, because you said it's about like an eighth a day or whatever, are you breaking it up? Or? I would break it up in half, I would take some in the morning and then I would take some in the afternoon. I didn't have a job at this point, so that was good. Um, so I was able to do this uh, freely and not have to worry. Um, How do you not but, get a job and not have to worry? That's what I want to ask. <laughs> I was taken care of at that point. So, <laughs> um, but I trust mushrooms more than I trust microdosing on acid because um, acid is a chemical still, and I, I do trust mushrooms more because they're you know from the earth. So um, I, I don't even know if I would even attempt to experiment with that. Um, but you know, it, I would have to see long-term studies before I decided to microdose on acid. But I, I definitely know from experience that um, mushrooms are not dangerous if you're going to microdose with them. Unless you're schizophrenic, then be careful. <laughs> In the back, uh, when it comes to ayahuasca, I uh, heard you mention the most possibilities, which I've actually used a couple times. And do you recommend that over something like psychotheria, or do you have like the other DMT? I think that's the only main component that I've had with DMT and ayahuasca. I think that it, it, it contains the most DMT, so I would definitely recommend that. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've heard of some people talking about parma huasca or prairie huasca is one made out of bundle flour, and it's almost universally uh, less appreciated than the, the straight up ayahuasca. Would you just need to take more of it, or is it just different altogether? Both. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I, I personally advocate using Mimosa because it has basically only NNDMT. Not only does it have the highest ratio of NNDMT to other alkaloids, it really barely has any of the other ones at all. That's, I think, the main reason why most people go with Mimosa. It's by far the best. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, any other questions will be around, so. We might be tripping. <laughs> yeah, I, I maybe. appreciate you guys. I, I know this, this is not always like, it's great to share, but it's also a little risky. So I, I really appreciate the fact that you guys all. Well, they all know something about it, so they know something. Yeah, I read all of this on yeah, this, this, is, this is all exclusively anecdotal. <laughs> <laughs> it's hypothetical. Thank you.